Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yannick Garayeb and I'm the Senior Health Information Specialist with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Today we have Dr. Linda Balnese who will provide an informative presentation on medical cannabis. Dr. Balnese is an Associate Professor in the College of Nursing in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Balnese has been active in complementary and integrative integrative medicine for the past 20 years and is the lead investigator of the Complementary Medicine Education Outcomes Program, also known as CAMEO. She has also been engaged with health service and policy research on medical cannabis in Canada. She is president-elect of the Society for Integrative Medicine and serves on the board of the International Society for Complementary Medicine Research and the Canadian Interdisciplinary Network for Complementary Medicine Research. Today, Dr. Balney's presentation is entitled, Where There's Smoke, the Role of Cannabis in Brain Tumors. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Balney. Great. Thanks so much, Janek. And good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, before we get started, I just want to indicate that uh, this presentation has really been geared towards patients and their family members. Uh, however, we do have a fair number of health professionals uh, on the line. So if you do have specific questions around clinical guidelines or clinical decision making, uh, do feel free to post them and we'll either get to them today or I can follow up uh, through Janek later on. So thanks again to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada for their kind invitation to provide this webinar. So let's get started. Uh, just to start off with, I do want to just acknowledge that I don't have anything to disclose except the fact that I have a PhD student, Riel Kapler, who's funded through the MyTax funding program. And we received funding from the Canadian Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids, as well as AFRIA, which is a commercial licensed producer of medical cannabis in Canada. I've added a couple of learning objectives to today's uh, session. First off, I'm just going to provide a very, very brief history of cannabis as a therapeutic agent, just to give a little bit of background about, you know, why are we interested in cannabis and where has it come from? I'm then going to touch on the current regulatory framework for cannabis in Canada, both talking about the medical as well as the non-medical use of cannabis. We'll then dive into talking about the potential benefits and risks associated with medical cannabis, really with a focus on its role in cancer and symptom management, as well as its potential around cancer treatment. Uh, and we will be specifically talking about the potential role of medical cannabis in brain tumor treatment. So just a little introduction. What first comes to mind when you think about cannabis? You know, and I think there's a lot of uh, stigma associated with this plant and what many people consider to be their medicine. Uh, there's a lot of different words uh, and slang that we associate uh, with cannabis. Uh, I actually do use the word cannabis rather than using something like marijuana or pot because I see those terms as being quite pejorative and are associated with a lot of stigma, they're associated with the war on drugs, uh, and with its recreational use. And I think it's really important when we're talking to patients and families, you know, that we address it with its true term, which is cannabis. However, when you're talking to with, with a patient who may be already using uh, cannabis, it may be appropriate to use the terminology that they're most comfortable with when talking about their use and the potential you know, pros and cons of that therapy. Historically, uh, I think we often forget that cannabis has been used as a form of medicine uh, for about 5,000 years. We first saw it being mentioned actually within traditional Chinese medicine in China, where it was being used for a variety of ailments, including gastrointestinal issues, uh, things like hemorrhoids. Uh, and we also saw its use being, uh, being touted in Egypt, where we have a hieroglyph here showing that it's used in terms of coping with some of skin ailments as well as coping uh, with things like uh, sleep issues as well as pain. And in fact, the Egyptians used cannabis as uh, an anesthetic during their forms of surgery. Cannabis also was quite prominent in some of the lay medicines that we saw in the early 1900s. And many of the individuals that were kind of selling these tinctures often had some form of narcotic embedded in it, with cannabis being one of the most popular. And it wasn't until around the 1950s and 60s, particularly when cannabis was being uh, brought into North America from South and Central America, that we really saw it starting to be stigmatized and transformed 
uh, into something that was seen as a recreational drug uh, that could cause social harm. What we also need to be conscious about in terms of cannabis is that it hasn't just been used in medical purposes, that it actually is an agricultural crop called hemp, and it's been used for thousands of years in such things as paper, in clothing, as well as in ropes. We, if you ever go to, I'm in Winnipeg, and if you ever go to the, uh, the local museum where we have a replica of the Nunsuch uh, ship, you will have this distinctive smell, which is the hemp rope. And it remains a ma very major agricultural crop in many uh, settings in the world, including here in Canada. So what is cannabis, though, when we're talking about it in a medical cannabis context? Uh, the true term is cannabis sativa. And as I mentioned, it's a fibrous plant that's been used for, by humans as an agricultural crop for many different purposes. When we actually look at the plant itself and you know, pull it apart at the bench level, it's made up of over 110, 110 active compounds called cannabinoids. Uh, it also contains other components. The most prominent are the terpenes, which are these kind of aromatic oils that provide uh, the characteristic smell of cannabis. Uh, for example, we have things like myrcene, which is thought to have this sedative or an analgesic effect. We have the limonenin, which is, has a role potentially in depression and inflammation. Uh, and then we have panine, which there's been some thought it could help uh, aid memory. This is all kind of very anecdotal evidence uh, that has been derived from people that have been using cannabis, as well as from growers that have been producing it through the cannabis dispensaries, as well as through the licensed producers. When we think about the specific cannabinoids that we're most interested in from a medical perspective, there's really two that come to the forefront. So the first is a THC, or a delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the most well-known, and it's associated with the high or the psychoactive effect that we most often associate with cannabis, and probably has made it so popular within recreational circles. The other cannabinoid that uh, is starting to get a lot of attention within the research world is cannabidiol, or CBD. It is thought to have an antipsychotic effect as well as being an anticonvulsant, have antioxidant properties, and there's also some thought that it may play a role in managing inflammation as well as having an analgesic effect. CBN uh, does have, it's a cannabinol, uh, has a weak psychoactive properties. There hasn't been any clinical trials or any human studies yet with this compound. Again, anecdotally, people believe that it may help with people that have sleep issues, but we need more research to really understand what specific role it may have. The reason I mentioned all the different components is that there's a, a, a lot of thought uh, within the research world as well as in the lay world uh, that these cannabinoids work together in an entourage effect. Um, there isn't a ton of research to support this, but there's beginning to be some bench research to suggest that when, for example, cannabidiol, CBD, is combined with THC, it reduces the psychoactive effect that people are experiencing and it allows people to have a higher dose of THC than what they can normally tolerate. And that is often why people really, um, many patients prefer to use the herbal form of cannabis, the actual plant, versus using a pharmaceutical form, which is typically isolated one or two of the specific cannabinoids. Patients are worried that if they take something that's been isolated out, they're going to be using this overall entourage effect and perhaps miss out on the effect of something that we haven't researched yet, but may be beneficial. Now, in terms of the endocannabinoid system, you know, when I'm doing this in person, I ask, health professionals, how many of you had any training in the endocannabinoid system? And many people don't have had any training or they haven't even heard of it. And it actually is an endogenous or an internal system within our bodies that's comprised of receptors, CB1 and CB2. And these are located throughout the human body. We see the CB1 receptors most prominent in the nervous system, the brain, and in certain organs whereas CB2 seems to be more situated within the immune system. What we do uh, uh, acknowledge when we have done some of the bench research and some of the human studies is that there are endogenous cannabinoids within our body that appear to act as either neuromodulators or immunomodulators. 
That being that when these receptors are stimulated by these cannabinoids, we see, we see the release of certain neurotransmitters as well as certain immune compounds within the body. And what happens is when we have an exogenous cannabinoid coming from a cannabis plant uh, come into the body, for example, THC, it seems to stimulate the release of these compounds. So THC stimulates neurotransmitters, and we see this increased release of, of a compound called dopamine, which again is associated with that feeling of relaxation, and for some people that, that feeling of, of a high. And this is just a little diagram that, you know, we really kind of, uh, um, perceive these cannabinoids to kind of be keys that fit into these receptors like a lock. And when they do uh, snap in, we see this kind of cascade happen where different transmitters are being released and then stimulating uh, receptors in the body. And as I mentioned, we find these receptors throughout the human body. So it's not surprising that when these products are, compound, or, 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 are consumed, that they're actually stimulating uh, various aspects of our bodies and we're seeing uh, medical or therapeutic effects. Now, just a little bit of statistics in terms of the rates of cannabis use in Canada. In terms of non-medical or recreational cannabis, just over 10% of the Canadian population over the age of 15 are reporting using cannabis in the past year. And this rate is double for men versus women. And we look more closely at those over the age of 20, uh, over the age of 15 years, 28% uh, are saying in the past three months they've used cannabis daily. So this is a very prominent social activity uh, that Canadians are engaging in. And the highest rates are in British Columbia, which may not be a surprise to some of you, and the lowest rates are in Saskatchewan. Turning to medical cannabis, in 2011, a survey was done that showed 420,000 Canadians reported using cannabis for medical purposes, with half of them saying they're using it for chronic pain. And this is for such things as migraines, uh, joint pain, arthritis. What was interesting is uh, just at the end of last year, uh, Health Canada looked at how many people were accessing cannabis legally under the new Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations and approximately 130 Canadians had signed up for that program. So as you can see, there's a little bit of a gap of how many Canadians are reporting using cannabis and how many are accessing it through the legal system. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in terms of access and how some people have struggled uh, with that. But this number is rapidly growing. In fact, it seems to be increasing by about 20 to 25,000 Canadians every three to four months. So I'm going to briefly just touch about policy because I think it's important, particularly for health professionals, to have some sense of where we've come from and where we're headed in terms of cannabis policy in Canada. So just to start off with, in 2001, uh, we had the medical marijuana access regulations uh, developed. And this regulation was developed really because Canadians were demanding access in a legal way to medical cannabis and that they want to be able to do it without the risk of being incarcerated or being uh, arrested for possession of what was and what still is a controlled substance. Under the MMAR, people could either grow their own marijuana or their own cannabis. They could designate someone to grow it, which if you're living with a chronic disease, you may not be able to have the ability to grow your own uh, cannabis or you may not be situated in a place that you could grow it or they could access it through one licensed producer, which was actually uh, being grown in a mine in Flin Flon, Manitoba. In the 12 years that followed, there was numerous court challenges to how constitutional the MMAR was and how restrictive it was in terms of what people had access to in terms of the type of product and the quality of the product. There was also concerns raised from law enforcement and from community agencies that people that were growing it at home or having someone grow it, uh, that there were some social risks, that people were having home invasions, that there was diversion to the illicit market, diversion to youth, uh, and even people that were growing it were having uh, household issues in terms of mold uh, and electrical fires. Uh, and so the MNPR came into effect which took away the ability of people to grow their own cannabis and instead uh, developed a system of licensed producers uh, where people could access it uh, through this legal system and have cannabis mailed to their home. 
Under that program, we had just under 50,000 Canadians that were registered. They could get documentation from a physician or from a nurse practitioner, uh, and they were allowed to have a maximum of 150 grams a month of dried cannabis. But again, there was more court injunctions. And most of those court injunctions were really focused on the affordability of cannabis under these new licensed producers, as well as people were struggling with only having access to dried cannabis, with some people preferring to have access to um, cannabis that had not been dried, as well as other things like oils, tinctures, and edibles. Uh, people were also, um, you know, concerned that they didn't have the ability to grow their own cannabis, and not everyone had access to the type of cannabis that they wanted through these licensed producers. So in 2016, we had the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations, the ACMPR, come into effect. And it has actually allowed people, again, to grow their own cannabis in limited uh, amounts, as well as designate someone to grow. They also have increased the number of licensed producers, and we are now up to about 50 in Canada and counting uh, that uh, are able to provide not only dried cannabis, but also um, uh, undried cannabis, as well as cannabis oil to individuals. Edibles are still uh, not legal. Uh, they can be developed by an individual in their own home, uh, and uh, we also don't have edibles uh, legal in Canada yet because of some of the concerns of diversion to youth and uh, inappropriate use by youth. And I'm going to touch a little bit on Bill 45, the Cannabis Act, uh, that is uh, focused on uh, legalizing cannabis for recreational purposes. Oh, and just to touch on, uh, oh, I've already touched on this. Um, the only difference is that uh, in terms of growing your cannabis, you're allowed to uh, grow five indoor plants, for those that enjoy uh, growing it outdoors, you're allowed a maximum of two outdoor plants. And uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of legalization, uh, I just want to touch on that Canada is not the first country to think about legalizing cannabis. Many countries have delegalized or decriminalized cannabis, but Uruguay was actually the first country uh, to legalize cannabis. And eight U.S. states have followed suit. Uh, and many more seem to be coming on every time they have, a, have an election. For Canada, though, Bill 45 was just passed in April and is thought to be brought into force by July 2018. That being said, we have some provinces that are asking for an extension on that because of the amount of time it will require for the provinces to set up a distribution and a regulation system. There's a lot of questions around Bill 45, particularly related to how non-medical cannabis is going to be regulated in Canada and distributed in each province. There's currently thought that the licensed producers will be playing a leading role in that. There's been some suggestion that provinces are looking at putting cannabis alongside liquor within liquor stores. Pharmacies have expressed an interest in being distributing centers. And the community-based dispensaries or the compassion clubs have also indicated that they would like to be uh, a source of uh, recreational cannabis in Canada. In terms of Bill 45, I'm just going to briefly touch on some of this because if you're working as a nurse or as a social worker or another health professional, you may uh, you know, be coming across people that are using this for recreational purposes, possibly as well as using it for therapeutic purposes. In terms of Bill 45, it's really focused on harm reduction. They've set a minimum age of 18 years and some provinces may choose to raise that minimum uh, age of being able to access cannabis. You're allowed to only possess a maximum of 30 grams of legal cannabis, again, dry, fresh plant, or oil. There's restrictions similar to tobacco in terms of how it is advertised and the labeling. And there's really stiff penalties for anyone that's found to be selling or engaging youth in the distribution or the development of cannabis with sentences up to 14 years in prison. So they really are attempting to control access by youth to, to cannabis. And they've built in some regulations where there must be public education uh, about the risk as well as potential substance abuse uh, risks of using cannabis. And they're attempting and they're actually meeting this week, uh, the provinces with the federal government, about the prices and the taxation of, of non-medical non cannabis because they really want to reduce the illicit market and not tax it to the point that the illicit market can still remain. 
And they're also a focus on having a safe and responsible supply, uh, supply chain. Sorry for the, uh, the spelling error there. They really want to avoid having any uh, possibility of contamination of cannabis by pesticides, herbicides, you know, controlled substances. Uh, um, but they're really letting the provinces decide how they're going to retail it and distribute it. And they're suggesting that if some provinces choose to have a very restrictive system, that there could be direct-to-consumer mail ordering available so that, again, people aren't moving into the illicit market. Personal production will be allowed. You'll be limited to four plants per resident, not per person. And you have to grow it from legal seeds or seedlings that are uh, obtained from a licensed producer. And the maximum height you can grow a plant is to one meter. And you must ensure that you have responsible security measures and, and growing conditions so that any of those community harms are avoided. And I just want to kind of point out, because with all the kind of hoopla around uh, Bill 45, I run across a lot of Canadians that are saying, oh, cannabis is legal now. And it actually is not. It is still an illegal substance. And you could be persecuted if you are caught uh, with cannabis without having a medical cannabis authorization. So just an FYI. You know, very briefly, I just want to comment on the fact that, you know, there is some impact of legalizing uh, cannabis on medical cannabis itself. You know, I do think we're going to be seeing a growing number of licensed producers, which hopefully means that we'll have a greater variety of sources for patients to access cannabis for therapeutic purposes. And we potentially will see a reduction in cost because this will be a growing market, there'll be more competition, and as a consequence, we may see the cost of medical cannabis lower even further. In terms of the quality and type of cannabis, I actually have a bit of concerns that as the, the recreational market for cannabis grows, we could be seeing more and more interest by licensed producers in focusing on high THC cannabis, the ones that are more likely to get you that high that recreational users will be seeking. And we may not see the variety development around some of the CBD strains that may actually have a role for treating some of the symptoms that people with cancer are experiencing. So I think that's going to be something that we'll have to watch carefully as the legal market expands. I also have had a bit of concerns you know, we see a lot of focus by federal and provincial governments on the potential social harms of legalizing cannabis. And I am actually concerned that we could be stigmatizing cannabis use even further because there will be so much focus on the potential social harms, we're not going to be paying attention to what the potential uh, health benefits may be of cannabis. And we actually are seeing some of the research programs develop in Canada that are solely focused on the social harms and the recreational use, and we're not seeing research programs develop that are focused on the therapeutic, which, which is disappointing. But that being said, maybe with a legal market, we'll be uh, better able as researchers to access cannabis and actually do research on this legal substance. I do think we'll see more education and health services for people around cannabis because of legalization. There's more money being directed towards those services being developed. Um, and I already mentioned some concerns. We may either see more focus on the medicinal properties of cannabis as people are using it more and more and finding that it may be beneficial for them, or we could see more focus on the social harms. So I'm just going to uh, flip into some of the potential benefits and risks of medical cannabis. Uh, and I just want to have some, some caveats around it. You know, foremost, when I'm talking about the benefits of cannabis, most of the research that we've been seeing has been focused on the pharmaceutical forms of cannabis. And I've just listed some of those there that have been legally or are legally available in Canada. And these are pharmaceuticals that have isolated typically either THC or CBD in combination uh, and has been available as a, as a prescription. Uh, we also, most of the research uh, that I might be commenting on around cancer has really been focused at the bench level or in animal models. And we haven't seen the same number of studies in humans, partly because this has been a controlled substance with a lot of stigma attached to it. Uh, and when I talk about some of the risks associated with cannabis, most of the research on risks has been looking at high-use recreational users of cannabis. And these risks may not be experienced by uh, medical cannabis users who may be using it in smaller amounts or using a more balanced concentration of THC with CBD. So those are just some caveats before we begin. So in, in talking about the risks and benefits, I'm going to be focusing primarily on THC and CBD uh, because these are the main cannabinoids that we have any research on. And I think this chart 
is really helpful because it kind of just gives a bit of a highlight of how these two cannabinoids, you know, can have similar effects or where one can have a prominent effect and the other is not seen to have that effect. For, for example, THC and sedation, you know, it definitely seems to sedate individuals, whereas with CBD, we don't see that sedative effect. Same thing with something like uh, um, psychotropic or the high, we see that associated with THC, whereas a cannabis that's rich in CBD does not seem to have that same psychoactive effect. And I think that's important to recognize as we look at the concentrations of cannabis that people are using and whether they're using a balanced one or one that's high in THC or CBD. So in talking about the potential benefits of cannabis, I'm going to touch on symptom management, the people that are living with cancer. I'm going to talk about treating cancer and some of the preliminary research that's been done related to brain cancer as well as other cancers. And then I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the other health conditions, recognizing that many individuals living with cancer and with things like brain tumors may also be living with other comorbid conditions. But before I go on, I'm going to bring Janik in because I am curious. Uh, I know we have a lot of health professionals online, but for those of you that are patients and perhaps some of the health professionals, I'm curious to know if any of you are currently using uh, cannabis. So Janik, if you could maybe pop up um, our, uh, our survey questions, sure that would thing. be great. Sure thing. Hey, everybody. So we'll get you to please select one. Are you currently using medical cannabis? Yes, no, or not applicable as you're not a brain tumor patient or survivor? Give you a second to uh, respond. Looks like the voting is slowing down, so we'll close that poll and uh, we have 6% are using um, medical cannabis, 31% no, and 63% not applicable. And I will go to the next poll, Dr. Bellmings. That would be great, yeah. Right. So the second one is, uh, why are you currently using medical cannabis? And please select as many, um, as many options for those of you who are using medical cannabis. Give everybody a second to vote. Okay. Great, thank you everyone. And the results, we have 43% are using medical cannabis for pain relief, 29% for nausea and vomiting, 57% for anxiety and distress, 86% to treat um, their cancer or brain tumor diagnosis, and 14% said other. Great. Thanks, Janik. You're welcome. And I know we had a small number, um, but it was interesting to see that diversity and why people were using, uh, using cannabis. So let's carry on. So, um, I want to start off with pain management, and that actually is where we see the most research in terms of the potential role of cannabinoids in managing pain. And we do know that THC and CBD both seem to have an analgesic effect. Um, there's been research done in palliative care, in advanced cancer, as well as in other conditions like uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, in terms of looking at its role in managing pain after surgery, as well as managing neuropathic pain. Uh, and there's been some interesting research come out in the last couple of years, but only in mice models, that suggests that CBD may actually play a role in preventing chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy from actually forming. But we need to move into some human studies to actually show if it has efficacy. There was one small study done with uh, a nabiximal, Cetavex, on, uh, as a treatment for chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy. However, it did trend towards significance, and the researchers, uh, Lynch and teams, uh, they suggested that there needed to be either be a larger dose or they needed to have a larger sample size in order to be able to determine the effect. Um, what's been interesting is Donald Abrams, who's at UCS, uh, UCF, um, sorry, University of San Francisco, uh, he sent some pilot work to suggest that cannabis may actually work synergistically with opioids uh, without increasing the negative side effects or some of the, um, you know, the sedative effects 
of opioids. However, that study was only done with under 25 individuals, and further research is, noted, uh, is needed to know if we can actually use uh, THC, CBD alongside opioids without any negative effects. What's been interesting is that uh, when you look at some of the kind of clinical uh, commentary around using a cannabis for pain management, is that when they're talking about dose, they're often saying that you often have to use such a high dose of THC that you, it's important to have CBD alongside it so that some of the negative side effects of THC are kind of mitigated uh, by the CBD. So that's why I think we're seeing more research on things like uh, the Bixamols that have a, a combination of THC and CBD. In terms of uh, nausea and vomiting, uh, there's been a great deal of anecdotal as well as a growing research on some of the pharmaceutical forms of cannabis that THC and CBD are effective in managing nausea uh, following chemotherapy. Uh, there's been a lot more research done on, as I mentioned, the pharmaceutical forms, and it's been much more significant and persuasive than the research that's been done on herbal cannabis. And there's been some concern, again, that the herbal cannabis perhaps uh, wasn't at the right dosage or it wasn't at the right concentration for it to have effect. Uh, but we, there's only been three trials on herbal cannabis at this time, and we probably need some larger trials to know if it's truly effective. Anecdotally, many patients say that they do consume cannabis, either vaping or smoking, uh, even through edibles, and they do find it effective. Many people, though, when they're going through cancer treatments, can have issues with their appetite, and with people with advanced cancer can have issues with cachexia or kind of a muscle wasting. Uh, it has been found that THC and CBD may help stimulate appetite, um, but it has not been found to restore tissue mass, and most of that research has actually been done in HIV and AIDS patients. Um, there hasn't been any research specifically in cancer-related cachexia, uh, and the suggestion in the literature is that research needs to be done because some of the animal models, animal models suggest that it may be effective. Uh, so we're kind of waiting for those trials to come forward. In terms of sleep problems, I think we're starting to recognize as health professionals that many cancer patients suffer from sleep issues such as insomnia as well as things like sleep latency. We also uh, recognize that sleep apnea has been a growing concern in Canada, particularly as um, the obesity crisis uh, expands. There is a suggestion that THC and CBD may be effective in, in managing those issues, and we're starting to see research on its role in PTSD-related nightmares. However, this research is very preliminary, and we can't really have any conclusive findings that would, um, you know, provide any clinical recommendations at this time. In terms of other health conditions, just touching on these, I think a lot of people are aware of some of the very uh, provocative, you know, documentaries that have been produced around the role of cannabis in treating uh, severe pediatric epilepsy. Uh, and that's really been focused on cannabis products that have been very rich in, in CBDs, uh, and they have been shown uh, in case studies to significantly reduce seizure frequency as well as severity. And there are numerous clinical trials that are currently underway. In terms of cannabis' role, particularly CBD, in treating seizures that may be secondary to, to brain tumors, you know, I haven't really seen any commentary about that yet or any research that's come out, but I think it would be intriguing knowing what we're starting to understand about its role in seizure control if it may be something that could be effective for people with brain tumors as well. Uh, in terms of antispasticity in uh, multiple sclerosis patients, we have had some research come out to suggest that people that smoke cannabis or are using uh, Cetavex and the Bixamols, which is a spray, uh, that they have found that their spasms have been reduced as well as pain related to the spasms have been reduced when they have consumed cannabis. And again, the suggestion is, is that you need quite a large amount of THC to see this antispasistic uh, response and that combining it with a CBD may be helpful in reducing that kind of psychoactive effect that some people experience. There's also been some suggestion that it may have a role in inflammatory bowel disease, and that's because there are so many cannabinoid receptors within the GI tract. And so there's beginning research to suggest it may improve some of the symptoms associated with colitis as well as with Crohn's disease, but this is very much, again, beginning research. And as I mentioned, there's been some research actually coming out of Canada, Zachary Walsh at uh, UBCO. 
He's been looking at the role of cannabis in treating veterans that are suffering from PTSD. Um, there's also been some suggestion that CBD may have a role in managing anxiety. And we know that a lot of people talk about using cannabis as a way of relaxing and coping with stress. But we don't have research with the herbal plant right now to, to support this again at a clinical level. And very lastly, and this is again quite provocative, you know, we've often thought of cannabis as being a gateway out of addiction, uh, or gateway to addiction, and using other controlled substances, but there's beginning interest that maybe cannabis could be a gateway out of addiction. Uh, and they're looking at the role of particularly CBD in helping people cope with some of their withdrawal symptoms. Uh, as well as their use of other substances like tobacco. And there's starting to be some indication at the community level that people are using cannabis as a substitute for alcohol and other types of drugs, and that there's been some beginning survey research to suggest that people are using it to reduce their use of cigarettes as well. And then, treating cancer. And you know, it's been since about 1975, there was some research funded by the National Cancer Institute to suggest that cannabinoids may have a real role in treating cancer. And again, this has been with cells in a test tube or with mice models. And we see a whole host of, of effects from using cannabis or applying cannabis. We see apop apoptosis, the death of cancer cells when cannabis is applied. We see the inhibition of the growth of blood vessels to tumors, which is thought to then play a role in shrinking tumors. We also see less invasiveness of tumor cells, reducing the possibility of cancer spreading throughout the body. And we also know that cannabis seems to work as an anti-inflammatory as well as an antioxidant, which may also be processes that play a role in reducing the spread of cancer within the body as well as possibly formation of cancer. Uh, and there's been some beginning research, again, um, Donald Abrams has been summarizing this, where it's starting to suggest that maybe THC and CBD could work synergistically with chemotherapy and radiation and actually promote uh, the, the outcome of these therapies and perhaps make some cells that were unresponsive to these therapies now responsive. But again, this is again been at the, you know, the mouse level. It doesn't necessarily apply to the human body, so we need to be moving uh, more rapidly into human trials. When it comes to brain tumors, you know, there's been some really uh, interesting mice research that's been uh, conducted that has shown that when you take THC and you add it to temozolomide, that it does suppress uh, gliomas, uh, and particularly those that have been resistant to chemotherapy. And there's been further re uh, research just done recently and published looking at pediatric neuroblastomas to suggest that THC and CBD may play a role in reducing the spread of these tumors and perhaps actually shrinking the size of these tumors. When we turn to human studies, there's only been two small trials conducted uh, in Spain as well as in the United Kingdom that's focused on glioblastomas. And these are reoccurrent glioblastomas. And this research has been, you know, I think really exciting for those of us that are involved in, in, in cancer research because we've seen significant reduction in tumor size as well as we've seen a prolongation of life. And just in February, um, the company that produces Sedevex just released their findings. And again, sorry for the uh, a few spelling errors here. There was a, a phase two placebo controlled trial that was conducted with 22 individuals that were receiving uh, temo, uh, temozolomide uh, and had reoccurrent GBM. And those that received uh, the set of X had an 83% one-year survival rate compared to 53% uh, percent in the placebo group. And the median survival in the set of X group was 181 days longer. So that's <clears throat> very provocative. However, it was only done in 22 patients. And uh, the company that has created set of X has, uh, you know, basically said that, you know, based on these results, we need to be moving into much larger trials with much you know, larger populations in multi-sites around the world to be able to reach any conclusions about whether this you know, THC CBD spray may actually have a role as a treatment in glioblastomas. So very provocative, and I think it's you know, really pushed many patients you know, that are considering cannabis to think that this may be something that could be useful for them, particularly if they're living with reoccurrent uh, GBM. 
In terms of other cancers, we're really at the bench research stage. There really hasn't been any other uh, clinical trials that have been conducted. However, there are a couple of trials that are currently in preparation and just launching in the United States. And a whole host of cancers, breast, prostate, lung, skin, pancreatic lymphoma, there's been bench research to suggest that they may have a role, uh, cannabinoids may have a role in controlling these cancers, but we urgently need more research before we can have any firm treatment recommendations. I want to touch briefly on some of the, um, the risks of cannabis. You know, foremost, we, you know, any type of drug that you take could have physiological effects. With cannabis, we do see cardiovascular effects. It can increase your blood pressure, your heart rate. It can, you know, make arrhythmias worse if you're living with arrhythmias. For some individuals, their nausea doesn't get better. It actually gets incredibly severe. We call that hyperemesis. It's, it's rare, but when people experience that, we tell them to take a very hot shower, which seems to somehow nullify the effects. If you're smoking cannabis, there is some concern that it could irritate the bronchial tubes and worsen asthma if you've been diagnosed with asthma. We haven't been able to find a link to lung cancer. There's been about 10 years of research trying to show that link. And because of its potential, you know, you know, effects in terms of treating cancer, it may be that, you know, cannabis, even though it, it's causing irritation to the lung, it's preventing maybe lung cancer from actually being formed. However, if you smoke cannabis alongside tobacco, there's a concern that it may actually worsen it. There's always a concern if you're taking any cannabis that is not being produced through a legal supplier that it could have contaminants, uh, pesticides, herbicides, as well as street drugs uh, attached to it. So that's something to be cautious of. And there has been some bench research to suggest that when you use cannabis, that there could be early pregnancy failure as well as it could lead to embryo uh, defects. So that's very important for anyone that might be pregnant and trying to cope with morning sickness, that cannabis may not be a, a good drug of choice for you. Cannabis is processed through a certain drug metabolism pathway in the body called the P450. We've only had a couple of small studies that suggest that it doesn't have a negative impact on certain chemotherapy agents, but you still need to be cautious and you should consult a pharmacist if you're using other medications to make sure that you're not clearing that medication too soon or there could be a negative interaction. It may potentiate if you're drinking alcohol, if you're using barbiturates, it does seem to potentiate or make worse those side effects. Uh, but as I mentioned, it doesn't seem to do that with opioids, but we need more research to be conclusive about that. As many of you have been mentioning the psychoactive effect, the high, you know, it does have clear cognitive functioning effects. It affects your concentration, it affects your long-term or short-term memory. You know, in youth in particular, we're concerned about how it may lower people's motivation to go to work, to, you know, do well in school. And there's contradictory data if whether it increases your IQ or decreases your IQ, and more research is needed on that. There's been a lot of concern about mental health issues, again, particularly in youth. Uh, and when we look at the issue of addiction, I don't use that term because we don't see the typical withdrawal symptoms that we see with other controlled substances, but we do tend to see a dependency. And about 9% of cannabis users report use, um, reporting some form of dependency and some form of minor withdrawal when they stop using this. However, you have to think about context. If someone is living with a reoccurrent cancer, if someone has unfortunately moved to the end stage of their life, dependency and addiction issues may not be as relevant in that individual. There is some concern that when people use high THC cannabises, some people report having very severe anxiety attached to it. We've seen instances of psychosis, as well as we've seen an early onset of schizophrenia in individuals that have a family history. So again, this is where there's been a lot of caution around youth using it, as well as individuals that are living with mental health issues already. There are some public safety issues. If you're an individual that's using cannabis, you do need to be aware of the public safety issues. It's, you know, you're more likely to have an accident if you are smoking and driving, and if you're doing anything like construction, you have to be thinking about work safety. And I've already mentioned some of the concerns that if you're personally producing cannabis, you need to be thinking about some of the issues in your home in terms of access, as well as other harms. I am just going to skip this just because of our time, but there is new legislation coming out around smoking and driving. And if you are someone that's using cannabis, you should be aware of that legislation and ensure that you're not 
driving within four hours of consuming cannabis is currently uh, the gap that people are talking about. And if you feel that you are impaired, then obviously you should not be driving. Um, I'm going to skip the cannabis in use as well because I've been mentioning that there are concerns. The age right now is typically after the age of 25 when most brain development has uh, progressed where they're feeling that it is safer to use. Again, if you're living with a brain tumor, this may not be as much of an issue as it may be for other populations or those that are using it recreationally. So a lot more research is needed. We need to understand the mechanism of cannabis and how it works. We need larger trials, particularly looking at brain tumors and its uh, effect as a treatment. And we need research to really understand some of these issues around strains and dosages, as well as pre preferential routes of administration. Uh, and we also need to be comparing cannabis to other medicines that people are currently using. So I know we're running out of time and I want some time for questions. So I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly. Uh, but Janik's going to come in uh, quickly and just ask a couple more uh, poll questions. Sure thing. Here we go, everyone. Uh, the next poll question is, have you struggled to gain access to legal sources of medical cannabis in the past? Yes, no, or not applicable. Give everybody a moment to answer that poll question. Okay, looks like the voting has slowed down. And so we have 11% yes, they have struggled to gain access, 9% uh, no, and 80% not applicable. And I will show the last poll question now, Dr. Belnese, does that work? Yes, that's fine. Yes. Perfect. Okay. And the last poll question is, how would you like to access medical cannabis in Canada? And please select as many options as you would like, either from a physician or a specialist, from a nurse practitioner, from a community dispensary, such as a compassion club or from a licensed producer of medical cannabis or other. Give everybody a moment to vote on that. Lots of, uh, lots of traffic here. Okay, here we go. And we have 85% would like to access medical cannabis from a physician or a specialist, 58% from a nurse practitioner, 45% from a community dispensary, compassion club, or 76% uh, from a licensed producer, and 9% said other. Okay. Great. Thank you. And that's really interesting to show that diversity and when people are interested in accessing cannabis. And I think that reflects you know, the preferences of many Canadians that I've spoken to in my research. So I'm just going to uh, breeze through these again fairly quickly so we have some time for questions. Um, so in terms of gaining access, um, you do need to go through either a physician or a nurse practitioner in order to gain an authorization. It's not a prescription uh, under the current regulations. I do want to note that only Ontario has allowed nurse practitioners to actually authorize uh, medical cannabis. Other provinces like BC and Alberta, Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia are not actually supporting their nurse practitioners and authorizing. So that is an issue if you're struggling to go through your doctor, you can't really go through a nurse practitioner either at this time. You know, if you're trying to talk to your physician or your nurse practitioner, I suggest bringing in the forms that are available uh, through a link that I'll provide uh, through Health Canada, as well as maybe any research articles that you feel would support your request to be using it either for symptom management, using it for other health condition, or using it uh, in the context of, of brain tumors. You know, if you've been using cannabis, you might want to talk to them about using, you know, it in a trial and how you felt it might have helped you in managing your symptoms compared to perhaps other medications that you were using. You know, and, and try to go in, my, my suggestion would be like, ask them what are the pros and cons from your perspective of using medical cannabis, and make sure that they compare that to any of the pharmaceuticals that they may be recommending at the same time. Um, and if they're not supportive, or if they're not interested in discussing it, you may request a referral to another healthcare provider uh, that would be willing to discuss cannabis as a treatment option. It may be a pain specialist, it might be another oncologist, um, you know, and I think there is more and more people that are getting training and are knowledgeable that would be willing to discuss this with patients. You know, it's important, you know, as a clinician that you do a complete evaluation of a patient that's making that request and that you have a bona fide real relationship with that patient and that they're making a, an informed decision knowing the pros and cons of using cannabis. 
that you know if cannabis is authorized, that that is communicated with the rest of the healthcare team, and that you're looking out for any contraindications or precautions uh, in terms of recommending cannabis to an individual. And in Canada, typically, you need to establish that other conventional options have been tried and have not been successful. You should set a clear tr treatment goal and have a follow-up plan and obviously ensure that you have adequate documentation of that. You know, currently in Canada, medical cannabis is available through the licensed producers, and as I mentioned, it can be dried, fresh, or cannabis oil. We do have the medical dispensaries, however, they are not a legal source of cannabis at this time. There is a, a real variety across the LPs in terms of the type of products they're offering, in terms of whether they're high THC CBD or if they're offering balanced formulas. And many of the LPs have educators, often they're nurses, that you can speak to in terms of what they've heard anecdotally or if they've been doing some of their own survey research to suggest which of the formulas may be beneficial for the goal that you have in mind. You know, in terms of cannabis strains, we typically, um, I mentioned three kinds, but we have indica, sativa, and there's a new strain where they've combined indica and sativa together. There's some anecdotal thought that indica is kind of a, more of a sedating uh, cannabis versus sativa, which is stimulating. Uh, but we need more research to really understand when we should authorize which type of strain, which type of concentration for which type of health condition. So a lot of work still needs to be done on that. You know, there's a, I've mentioned some of the prescription cannabinoids. If someone's not interested in smoking or using herbal cannabis, you may be able to discuss using an actual prescription of cannabis, which uh, either is focused on THC and CBD or just THC alone. In terms of the routes of administration, we have smoked, vaporized, we have it orally, or we have topicals. You know, for people that are smoking or vaporizing it, it's often because it has a quick onset. Within five minutes, they will feel an effect. And if you're in pain, that can be very beneficial. And usually the effect lasts two to four hours. It has a very rapid kind of uh, consumption within the body. You know, vaporization is thought to be the safer route because it burns it at such a high heat um, that we don't seem to see the particulates being formed. However, just last month we had a paper come out to suggest that when people are vaporizing cannabis oil, particularly in the e-cigarettes, that some of the oil and thinning agents that they're using are actually creating formaldehyde, which actually could be our carcinogen when it's vaped. So you need to be very careful about what you're vaping uh, and what, uh, what other products could be in that because you actually could be uh, having some health concerns related to that. Uh, orally, when you consume an edible, like a brownie or a gummy, it can take up to an hour to feel an effect, and it lasts much longer, 8 to 12 hours. So that's not something that you should be doing if you know you have to go driving in a few hours. It's something that we often see people do at nighttime when they know they can wake up and that effect will be gone. Here's just some pictures of some of the vaporizers. They can be very subtle, which I think is a reason why many people like uh, to use them. You know, dose, it's a real question mark. You know, we need more research to understand what dose people should be receiving. Most clinical studies have used between 75 milligrams of dried cannabis to a maximum of 3.2 grams. Those are what most clinical studies have been using. Uh, and depending on the concentration of the THC in the, in the cannabis product, you'll be getting a different amount of THC in that dose. You know, Again, it seems that most of the research is focused on a dose between 2.5 to 3 milligrams of THC, where it seems to have a benefit around symptom management, and we see minimum psychoactive effect uh, from that dose. In Health Canada, when they do surveys, it suggests that, you know, on average, Canadians are using just under 3 grams of cannabis a day. And if you think about it, an average joint is around 0.75 grams of cannabis. Um, and really, when you're thinking about dose, titration is key. You need to start low and slowly increase your dose until you're seeing an effect, until you're seeing a reduction in symptoms. Uh, again, with cancer, it's hard for us to know. With the set of X trials, they're using a maximum of 12 sprays a day. There's been some suggestion that they can go even higher, but 12 is thought to be tolerable for people without seeing severe psychoactive effects. Um, I am going to skip over that one. 
You know, in using any drugs, there's, you have to be conscious of harm reduction. And there's a great little uh, booklet called Take Care with Cannabis that really talks about how can you use cannabis in a way that's safe. You know, and some key points is that you shouldn't be using cannabis alongside alcohol or tobacco. Um, that, again, I've mentioned about the driving issues or other activities that require, uh, you know, hand motor and cognitive attention. That vaporization edibles may be safer than smoking in terms of lung health. Because of the risk of communicable diseases, you shouldn't be sharing joints or other devices. Um, because of some of the effects on youth and their cognitive development, try to restrict use at, uh, until after 25 years of age. However, again, if you're living with cancer, this may not be as great a concern. Avoid use if pregnant and breastfeeding. If you have a history of substance use or disorders or mental health issues, you should discuss using cannabis with your, with your clinician. Uh, and use cannabis with trusted others. If you're using it in a social setting, be careful who you're using it with. And then, again, take steps to avoid uh, diversion to youth. There's some resources here for you. There's consumer information through the Health Canada site, as well as a practitioner guide. It's very long, but it's very detailed and very helpful if you're interested in knowing more about cannabis. The CCIC does have education sessions online as well as in person that you could attend. The National Cancer Institute has a monograph on cannabinoids in cancer, and Current Oncology Journal just came out with a cannabis uh, edition last fall. You may be interested in reading the journal articles in that edition. This is a rapidly growing health issue in Canada. You know, like all medications, there may be some pros to using cannabis, but there may be some adverse effects, and it may not be, be right for all individuals. And we need a lot more research on this to understand how to safely authorized use and for patients to safely use it. Evidence is changing rapidly. It's important to always stay current and to keep checking back into the literature. Uh, and if you're a patient, make sure you're engaging your health professional in using cannabis and making sure that they know that you're using it and talk to them about the possibility of adding cannabis to your treatment plan if appropriate. So I'm sorry I know it went a little bit longer, but I'm willing to stay for a little bit if we have time for some questions. No problem, Dr. Valneves. That was uh, very well done. Thank you so much for the information. And um, we only actually have two questions, which I think really speaks to your expertise and your, your thorough uh, presentation on this really important topic. We've had a lot of people over the last couple of years who have contacted us asking us about medical cannabis. So we we'll really appreciate you uh, joining us uh, today. So the first question is, um, a, a patient or a person, I should say, from Quebec. How does a patient or survivor of a brain tumor access medical marijuana in the province of Quebec? I'm not sure if you can touch on that at all. So in the province of Quebec, the medical association um, was concerned about cannabis and the lack of evidence. And they said that the only way that their physicians would be able to per, uh, authorize cannabis is if it was through the context of a research study. Uh, and that study is being run uh, by the CCIC uh, under Mark Ware at McGill. Uh, in terms of how the actual process is, in terms of how do you get into that study, uh, and basically it's a cohort study where they're following you over time and collecting data from you, which actually I don't think is a, is a bad thing. It would be an anonymous survey, but it's a way for us to start getting some data in terms of how people are finding this beneficial, what side effects they're, they're experiencing. I'm not sure how you get into the specific study. Uh, I know that I've been working with physicians in uh, Quebec in developing a clinical guideline for palliative patients so that we can increase uh, access for people that are in hospice and in palliative care. Um, but I'm not sure specifically about how to get into that study. I am happy uh, to have uh, uh, Jeannick uh, get your contact information and I can connect with Mark uh, himself and ask them uh, what that procedure is, and I can transfer that over to you. But you're right, they're in Quebec, there's kind of one more step, one more hurdle in, in a way uh, to get access to cannabis. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, the second question is, uh, can you comment on accessing cannabis through licensed producers, given so many indicated this as a choice of source uh, through one of our polls? Do these licensed producers have medical expertise? I think it varies. Um, we have a lot of, you know, LPs now. We have 50 of them. Uh, there have been some that have been very diligent in having uh, medical oversight. 
uh, having nurses uh, engaged in ensuring that their staff are being trained through the CCIC or taking courses through uh, you know, institutions like Kwantlen uh, in, in, in British Columbia. Um, and other LPs are, I think, much more geared towards the recreational market. Uh, where they're, you know, kind of waiting for legalization to happen and their focus has not been so much on, on, on medical use. So um, I think it's almost consumer um, be diligent rather than consumer beware in terms of going onto the various websites, looking at whether they have a scientific or a medical advisory committee and who's part of that, uh, looking at their educational material and how it's been developed uh, whether they're referencing, uh, you know, studies, uh, how their staff have been trained. Um, I think it really does vary, and that's why, you know, if you can find an individual uh, in your community, a health professional that has gone through the CCIC training or has some expertise in it, perhaps a pain doctor, um, to kind of consult and get their kind of, I'd like to say, unbiased perspective, neutral perspective in terms of cannabis use, whether it be effective for you, what dose to start at. Um, I think that's always good to kind of get that second opinion. Uh, that being said, uh, I want to acknowledge that, you know, this has been a very tough uh, medication to study because of its legal status and the stigma attached to it. And there's many community dispensaries uh, and licensed producers um, that have a great deal of expertise uh, through their just daily practice through their experiences of working with patients. Uh, and I think we sometimes forget that that experiential knowledge is a form of evidence. It's not one that we use to you know, prescribe medications on or make clinical guidelines on, but it can be very valuable in the absence of us having our studies uh, completed yet. So um, I, I think it's about you know, trying to find someone that you feel is, is you know, research, doing the research, you know, citing the literature, you know, talking about the pros and cons, uh, and then, you know, cautiously do an end of one study in yourself to see if it's having the effect that you want, work with a health professional to, to follow you up, and if it's not effective, then you may need to try a different strain or work with a different LP uh, to get access to uh, a cannabis product that you will find beneficial. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I think we'd love to start seeing standardization across the licensed producers. Uh, and I have a feeling that as this uh, market and as this uh, industry expands, there will be more standardization around what they can and cannot claim uh, related to the cannabis and the different strains and products they're developing. So I wish I had a better, you know, suggestion for you, but that's, that's all I have at this time. Well, I think you provided a lot of really great tips and suggestions, so thank you uh, for that. And just one last question. Um, are there any clinical trials currently being conducted in Canada? This particular person says that their son is 20, diagnosed at age 3 with a low-grade glioma, and uh, son is now 20. Tumor still present, has um, seizures and pain. With an age 25 guideline he may end up using under the recreational use would be nice to have guidance for you. So I don't know if you can make any comments on that or any clinical trials. Yeah, there's, there's no uh, clinical trials that I'm aware of right now. And I, I look through clinicaltrials.gov, which typically registers all clinical trials in um, North America, if not internationally. And I haven't seen anything. The only thing I'm aware of in terms of pediatric uh, t brain tumors has been that there's been some physicians at uh, Children's in British Columbia that have started doing a bit of case study work where they're following up uh, pe um, pediatric patients uh, to kind of monitor their use of cannabis, to be recording their dose and looking at side effects and impact on, on the tumor. Um, it may be possible to contact one of those physicians. Uh, they've created a bit of a guideline in terms of the, the cannabis oil that they're using and the percentage, that has been developed uh, by the families that have come before them and the ones that are currently uh, using cannabis oil. And the physicians are using that guideline to kind of monitor patients. So that might be one institution that, while they're not doing a trial, they may be able to give you some more specific guidelines. You know, and as I said, it's hard when someone is under the age of 25 you know, when you're dealing with a brain tumor, you know, you're, you're, you, you sometimes become a little bit less concerned about some of the mental health issues or the cognitive development issues when you're really, you know, fighting for someone's life. 
at the same time, you want to make sure that um, you're not disadvantaging them in the future, uh, that you know how to cope with any of the psychosis or severe anxiety that could be developed, and that you're maybe using a, a combination product that's going to mitigate some of those, those symptoms, those adverse effects. So, um, again, I'm not aware of any trials. I'm happy to do a little search around, and I can, you know, send that information through Genic. Um, but again, BC Children's might be a place where you can get a little bit of guidance uh, and suggestion around dose uh, and a follow-up plan that maybe you can share with your own clinician. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Belmeves. And like I said, such, um, such great information on a really important topic for our population. And um, uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to share your expertise with us. Uh, we had a lot of people that were engaged online today, and uh, a few of you were asking if this presentation would be, uh, the slides would be available later. Uh, we have been recording this presentation, and we will have it up on our website in the next couple of weeks, the latest. As soon as we have it up, I will send an email out to everyone uh, to let you know. We are not going to distribute the actual slides just because, as Dr. Bell needs to mention, like, things are changing so quickly and so um, and often in this industry that we don't want to be distributing the, the slides at this time, but the recorded webinar will be up on our website for anybody to, to take a look at at any time. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Belnies, for joining us. Um, before we sign off, I just had a couple of um, uh, things that I wanted to share with, um, with everybody here. And that was uh, our next national, uh, Join the Movement and Brain Tumors National Conference is going to be happening on Saturday, October 21st in Toronto. And the night before and the day before, we're going to be having a free research symposium and a celebration dinner that Friday night. Um, the conference itself on the Saturday, uh, early bird fee is $50. And if you're unable to come to Toronto and uh, join us in person, we will be live streaming the, um, the event all throughout the day on Saturday, October 21st. And uh, we had over 400 people live streaming last year, so we would love to have you all uh, join us for those presentations. And our keynote uh, presenter for that day will be uh, Dr. Brian Toyota, who will be joining us from Vancouver. And his topic is going to be on laser ablation of brain tumors, technology and the role in glioma management. And also, uh, something new that we have is that you can text to donate, uh, text Brain Tumor to 20222 to donate $10 to Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Um, our Brain Tumor Handbooks are actually an example um, of um, a resource that we offer for free to all of our patients and families across the country. And we do deliver uh, thousands of those every year, and the approximate cost of those handbooks are $10. And so I know that most of you probably have your cell phones just right beside you there. Uh, we would encourage you to text to donate brain tumor to 20222, and that's just a one-time fee of $10 that gets added to your cell phone bill. So thank you in advance for that. And thank you for joining us today, everybody. We will be sending a survey monkey, very short survey, so we can get your feedback on today's webinar. And for those of you who know people who didn't attend, for whatever reason, we will be sending the survey monkey to them as well to find out uh, why they were unable to, to join us today. And once again, we will provide the link uh, to the uh, webinar in uh, next week or so uh, once we have it up on the website. So thank you again, Dr. Balneves, for joining us. And um, thank you to everybody who's online. Take care. <laughs>